here I am, I'm driving uh, along uh, with my sister. I have uh, two brothers and a sister that live in the, the great state of Hawaii. And so here we are, we're driving along. Uh, there's two interstates on the island of Oahu. And so, so we're on H2, and as we're riding along, and you can go to that little video up there if you would. Um, this is what it looks like when we were passing by. When we were driving along, and, and all of a sudden we come across this place, it is called the Stairway to Heaven. You can kind of see the beautiful mountains. This is what my sister's backyard looks like. And so we're driving along H2, and as we're driving along, we go into this tunnel, but right before you get to this tunnel, there is this amazing staircase. It is called the Stairway to Heaven. It was uh, actually made in, in 1942. The U.S. Navy wanted an outpost, and so they put this up here as a radio tower in order to, to hear, you know, during World War and stuff. They wanted to make sure that they could hear everything that they needed to hear, so they built this top-secret station up there in Oahu. 3,000 922 steps is what it would take to actually get up to the very peak of this mountaintop. But when you would get up there in one step after the other, they, they've actually had it closed for decades now because they haven't maintained those steps. But every single day, uh, folks will actually trespass. They'll go through folks' yards. They will get up and they will take that trek to the very top of this mountain, 3,922 steps. Every single part of that step, some of the rails are still kind of creaky, some they are not maintained, they haven't been maintained in decades, and so you go at your own peril. People have died climbing these stairway to heaven, but when you get to the top, and you begin to look around, and you begin to see exactly, the fog kind of clears, it dissipates, you look around, and all you see is this beauty and the majesty of that one little bitty old island. It's 3,000 922 steps. But you know, in order to get to the top, you have to begin with one step at a time. One step at a time will get you to that peak. One step at a time will get you to that amazing view. One step at a time will get you further to those 3,922 steps. But it begins with just one step. For the next several weeks, as we continue through the book of John, we're going to look at what is your next right step. But what is the next step on your journey to the Lord? What is your next step growing closer to the Lord? What is your next step as a family when you begin to grow closer to the Lord and one another? What is your next step at your job? What is your next right step? Wonderful power in the blood. Welcome to Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We're in the heart of Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We look forward to you joining us in person sometime soon as we worship the Lord together. Except we never went to church. I knew of God, but I didn't know God. Prayer was just figure of speech. When I felt like I needed something, I'd pray. And sometimes it happened, sometimes it wouldn't, but that's as far as it went. Five years ago, I had a heart attack. While I was sleeping. I knew it was a heart attack by the way it fell. Had a triple bypass with numerous complications, <clears throat> but I survived. <clears throat> I, after the surgery and I was doing better, uh, I still had a fib. They couldn't figure out what was causing it, and they couldn't come up with a be able to take care of it. Finally, I was able to retire. Uh, by the way, we was living in Baton Rouge. 
I was able to retire and we was able to come to our hometown of Alyssa. Had a couple of minor surgeries while I was here. They were still trying to correct the AFib. Everything was fine until the morning of February 28th, 2018. I woke up, I told my wife I wasn't feeling well. I told her I was gonna go lay back down after she left for work. I got to feeling even worse after she left and I got to where I couldn't even walk. So I was sure that I was having another heart attack, even though I didn't feel the same as I did the first time. So I called 911, even though <laughs> I only lived like half a block from the hospital, but I still called down to come get me, and I called my wife at work, told her don't be speeding and all, that I'm just gonna go to the hospital and get checked out. My chest and back was hurting, and I was short of breath. I called, well, I already said I called 911. And, uh, I was taken to Our Lady of the Angels. About, I was admitted to the ER room, and the nurse came in and started asking for my symptoms. She said that by what I was telling her, she did not really think it was a heart attack. And that's about the last thing I remember. So now, for any of y'all that don't believe in angels, I've got proof today because mine's standing right here. Michelle Amber Fitzgerald. I don't remember what else happened, so she's gonna have to take it up from here. <laughs> So Mr. Donnie's recollection of me asking his symptoms actually happened at the end of his visit. Um, he'd been there, they were gonna go ahead and get him admitted. The residents were actually working on it. I just went in his room to ask about his pain, see how he felt, if it helped any. And he told me that his chest was a lot better but his back just wouldn't stop hurting. He said he kept, he kept kind of doing this little wiggle thing in the bed, he's like, it just won't hurt, stop. So I started asking him the other questions because I thought he was having an aneurysm. Um, and I went and asked the ER doctor if it was okay that we sent him to CAT scan. So we did. And about the time he was coming back, the ER tech was basically running through the ER with him. And she's mouthing to me, he's dissecting, which means his aorta is actually rupturing. Um, so we went ahead and called Lakeview because they're the only one with CT surgery. We um, tried to send him by air med, but the weather was too bad, so they couldn't take him. So we knew it was going to be bad because. Um, I don't know if many of you understand the aorta, but it's the largest vessel in your body. If that ruptures, you, you don't live very long, minutes at the most. And um, his was his entire aorta. When I called Lakeview and gave the nurse a report, um, you know, she called from Bogalusa, so it's kind of the, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, all right. And when I finished telling her how big it was, she said, are you sure he's safe for transfer? I said, absolutely not, but we can't do anything for him here. He's got to come to you. So we made the decision that I was going to go with him in the ambulance because if it were to complete, the paramedic wouldn't have enough hands to do what she needed to do. We wouldn't have been able to save him. Impossible. We could have tried, but that's about all we could have done. So when we get in the ambulance, I'm sitting at about his waist. I'm not really much of a hand holder, my husband can tell you. Not like a, you know, lovey girl. But he said, uh, he said, we're gonna make it, huh? And I said, yeah, we're gonna make it. And he reached out and grabbed my hand. I'm just kinda like, oh, okay, I'll hold your hand. So a little ways down the road, he's asleep. So I tried to weasel my hand out of his and he just latched down. I was like, okay, I can do this. About the time we get to Lakeview, he opened his eyes and looked at me and he said, am I gonna, am I gonna make it there? Are we almost there? And I said, we're fixing to take the exit right now. He said, okay, he said, I'm not scared though, I'm just worried about Beth. I said, okay, well, we're gonna see her in a minute. So we got her up to, got him up to the ICU and said our goodbyes and when I walked out the room, I was sure he would never live. 
that he would never go back to Bogalusa. And I had actually told Miss Beth when we left, she grabbed me by both shoulders and um, asked me if he was gonna live. And I said, I'm not sure, but if you need to say anything to him, you need to say it now. I don't like to lie to my patients. I don't like to give them false hope. And I was pretty sure he wasn't gonna live and that if she had anything she needed to say to him, it needed to be done then. But I've told him all along that God has another plan for him. There's something else he's supposed to do because otherwise he wouldn't be here today. his 
wound, and Donnie started freezing, shaking. He could not stop. And they took him outside. It was burning up outside, and he still could not stop. So the wound care doctor, which was Chris Keaton, called the home health nurse. And we went home after he finally stopped shaking and told her to get to our house. And there the home health nurse, she was supposed to draw blood, she was supposed to do numerous things, and she started checking his vital signs. And she said, y'all need to go back to the hospital. Donnie was septic. So from there, he, was admitted back to Lakeview, where we stayed over a week, and they wanted us to go back to Houston. They wanted to open him back up, remove the aorta graft, and literally leave him open with a wound back on him for six weeks, with a 5% chance of survival. And Donnie refused. He said, I gotta have a better chance I have to do this all over again. So they decided they were going to try an appeal, an antibiotic appeal by IV, which I had to learn how to do. I had to learn how to give him the IV every day. He took an IV for three months. Still to this day, Donnie has a bacteria on his aortic graft, which will never, ever go away. So continuously every day, we wonder, is he going to, you know, fake it through the day? Is this pill going to keep working? And so far, it has. Man. I hope I never have to go through anything like this again. But if I do, I will be right there by his side. I know one day he will not be here. But I'm sorry. I'm just not ready to let him go yet. I love you. Hey, if we bored to death here, but I just wanted to thank Marcus, the church, church members. For all the prayers and cards and calls and texts. When I was in Houston, I finally realized God was real. <laughs> Even then, there was times that every day there was bad news. There was times that I was ready to give up. I'm tired, I'm ready to go. But with Beth's love and support and faith, pulled me through, and she never left my side. And thanks to my angel, just about every nurse in the hospital calls me the miracle man. Thank you.
maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's probably one of the most honest worship songs I've ever heard. Uh, and it basically just speaks about just spending time with the Lord, not because of what He can give you, but just because of who He is. And it's so important that we just uh, we come to Jesus and we just share um, our fears, all of our doubts, our worries, and just cast it all upon Him. Um, just because, simply because of who He is, not because of the things uh, that He can give us and what we can benefit from. Uh, just simply spending time with the Lord. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you can do. I just want you. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I just want you and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will. Thanks. 
oceans are for me. Sing it out. And oh, how he loves us so. Step. 
for the next several weeks as we continue through the book of John, we're going to look at what is your next right step. But what is the next step on your journey to the Lord? What is your next step growing closer to the Lord? What is your next step as a family when you begin to grow closer to the Lord and one another? What is your next step at your job? What is your next right step? Uh, you know, one of the things I've learned, especially from my friends who have gone to Home of Grace or folks who have been around Home of Grace, they teach you this question. And I want to actually teach you over the next several weeks this one question. And the question is this, what is my what uh, next right choice? What is my next right decision? So when you're in recovery, you, don't, you cannot control the past. Can anybody here go backwards and rewind all the things that you've done? No, 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 you cannot, you know, your, your past has set the choices, the mistakes, the shame, and the regret that you've had over your past. You can't do anything about that. And in fact, you can't do anything about the 3,922 steps later on. Because where your life determines and what's going to happen in your future, you are not in control of that right now. The only thing that you're in control of right now at this very moment is what is my next right choice. What is the thing that I can do right now in order to, to get to where the Lord wants me to do? I cannot do anything about my past. I cannot change the future. But in order to get my future to where God wants it to be, it starts with one next choice. One next step. One right decision. Our word for this year is believe. And I wonder this morning, are you believing the Lord for anything? Are you believing the Lord for anything when it comes to your relationship with Christ? Well, I, I'm really believing that I'm going to grow closer to the Lord. Are you believing anything in your family? You know what, this year the Lord's going to take care of some of those relationships that have kind of strained in my life. He's going to get that right in my life. I'm going to make the next right choice. I can't do anything about my past or the future, but right now, my next right choice. And so what is your next step this morning? I want to give you, uh, it's going to blow your mind when you think about this word. I'm going to encourage you today to simply do this, to step out. To step out. If you turn to your Bible to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 gives us an example of a man who stepped out. He stepped out of his comfort zone. He stepped out of the box of who he thought you know, his life would turn out to be. He stepped out of all the things that were holding him down. And he stepped out in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. So John chapter 1 this is actually a man by the name of John who we're going to look at today. John chapter 1 starting in verse 19. When you find that on the Lord and his word, I invite you and encourage you to stand with us. If you're physically able to, just in honor of the Lord's word. John chapter 1, verse 19. The Bible says on this thing here, now this is the testimony of John, verse 19. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Verse 20. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Verse 22. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And as the prophet Isaiah had said, verse 24. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying these words, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. These things were done in Betharba, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Father God, before we go further, we just lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are a God of miracles, that, that not only are you a miracle working God in answering prayers or sending people in our life who, who are there right at the, the moment that we need them the most, but you're also God when, when there's no one else around, and when everything falls apart, and we can just say, Lord, we need you even right now. Lord, you're right there by our side. So we thank you not only for the miracle of healing, but we thank you for the miracle of healing our souls, and this morning may you. We take the next step in our relationship with Christ. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As you're seated, I'm going to ask you some questions. I want to see the kind of crowd that I'm dealing with. I know some of the back row Baptists back there, so, so I want to just kind of figure out the front row Baptists to the back row. What, what kind of crowd am I dealing with? And so, you know, we used to play this song, and, and some of this will age you and all, but there used to be this game show called Name That Tune. All right, name that tune. So, so let me ask you for a moment. If you were to answer uh, this one, if you know this song, Step by Step. No. 
Look at y'all. What kind of, what kind of book? I'm talking about the one, you know, oh God, you are my God, and I will follow you, and step by step, I'll serve you, and I'll follow you all my days. Y'all, y'all doing new kids on the block here. No, okay, here, let me, let me give you another one. Um, every little step. All right, okay, so I, I, we got some, like, 90s hood rats here. Uh, here's another one. Uh, two steps forward, I take. Oh, uh, look at y'all fall, actually. Okay, uh, how, how about this? Uh, you can do anything that you want to do, but uh, stay off of my. Yeah, or don't they say, don't, don't step on my blue, blue. Okay, that, that's what I figured. Um, more, more along Brother Whalen's line is this song. It's like, you know, I can't even walk without your whole man. All right, so, so I, I, I see, I, especially this side, I'm not really sure about in the front row. Um, but, but there are certain songs about the steps that we take. And, and for the next several weeks, I want to help you take the next step. Right step. Well, if we focus on John chapter 1, verse 27, look what it says there. It says, it is he, talking about Jesus, who is preferred before me. And, and there's this phrase that just captured me this week. He says, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. His sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. I'm not even worthy of the Lord to untie his shoes, is what he's basically saying. He's saying, look, I'm so less than God, I'm so beneath God, that I'm not even worthy to, to tie the very sandal straps of the Lord. And so I want to encourage you today. I want to give you three quick things to, to step out of. Here's the first thing that I want to encourage you to do, is I want to encourage you to step out of Jesus' sandals. Now, you may be wondering, well, I'm, I'm not really sure what you're saying there. I want you to step out of Jesus' sandals. In verse 27, it talks about the fact that, that it is Jesus who I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes or to even untie his shoes. I'm so beneath the Lord. Why? Because Christ is Lord. What is, what is John saying here? He's saying that Jesus Christ is superior over everything. If you look at your Bible in John chapter 1, you'll notice just in the first four verses, uh, verse 1 says, look, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we, we said at the very beginning that, that it is all focused on Jesus, that he was there at the beginning. Not only was he there at the beginning, but he has always been, been, been God. Verse 3 tells about the, uh, that he was there from the beginning. Verse 3 says that he was there through the very creator of it all. Verse 4 talks about him being the life and life. In the first four verses, and you go throughout the book of John, we realize that Jesus Christ is Lord and superior. He is bigger and greater. He's preferred over every other thing. That's why he says in verse 27 that Jesus is preferred before me. Christ is superior, preferred above Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. In fact, that was proven last week as we celebrated the resurrection of Christ. That death could not hold him, sin could not hold him, hell could not hold him down, that he is superior and above all other things. Do you understand the majesty and the greatness of Almighty God? He is Lord. He is Lord. He is, he is God. And what we learned from John is that he is God and you is not. You are not. Uh, you know, you, you are not the one who's in control. You are not the one who is Lord. I mean, they asked him this question. They said, look, look who, who are you, John? I mean, you out there in the wilderness and stuff, you know, well, who, who are you? He's like, look, I, I'm not the Christ. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. Verse 22, they say, well, what do you say about yourself? And that's really the question that you and I need to ask ourselves. Well, what do you and I say about ourselves? Who do we say that we are? So, some of you... Some of you men folks say to yourself, well, you know what? I got what I got because I work for it. I'm my own man. And I'm the one who controls my life. Uh, I'm the one who makes my decisions. You know what? Uh, I got my throne in my house. It's called a recliner. I kick that bad boy back when I need to. I push my recliner on one thing. I put my sweet tea on the other. I'm the one who's in control of my life. I'm the one who's in control of my house. I'm the one who is in charge of everything that goes on in my life. I'm the ruler, king, master of my universe. No, you ain't, baby. You, you, you are not. Uh, what does it say? It says that Jesus Christ is preferred before me, that, that he's the one in control. You can't even control the weather. 
you, you can't even control the fact. Uh, we had this thing in, in our Bible study class this morning. It, there is a Bible study class just for you at 9.15 every Sunday morning. We invite you to come and join us. Uh, but in our Bible study this morning, somebody was complaining about the fact that, you know what, they started to hurt in the ankle. They started to get these little flebitis things and knee bitis and, and then it gets the hip bitis and ankle bitis and elbow bitis and, and all these things. And then one of our, 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 our brave Sunday school teachers said, it's this new disease and it's been there a while. It's called AGE. Anybody got that? Anybody had any of those AGE moments in, the, in your life? What happens? Because all of a sudden, the older that we get, you can't control the fact that you have hair, that you don't have hair. That it used to be red, brown, black, yellow, and now it's whatever color it is, or there ain't any upstairs anyway. You know, you, you can, if you can't control that kind of stuff, you can't even control your hangnail, or when you know you're drinking something, and all of a sudden you spill your glass all over the, the restaurant. If you can't control that, who makes you think that you can control your life? That you can control what you do. That you can control that I'm in control of everything. And, and how do I know that some of us like to control every part of our life? Maybe, maybe it's because you're worried and stressed out about everything. Maybe because you can't get your hands out of stuff and you're always trying to fiddle with everything because you don't want to let that thing go. The, the Bible says, that, that John says, look, I ain't even worthy to untie his shoes. I ain't even in control of my own stuff. I can't even like just bow down and untie his stuff. Who makes you think that you have any right to your life except to just say, Lord, Lord, you're the one who's got you are God and I am not. That's one of the greatest places in your life you could ever come to. When you stop trying to control everything and manage everything and handle everything and fix everything, when you just have to be willing to say, God, it is all about, about you. Now, I don't know a whole lot about ruptured aortas and, and, you know, and all that other stuff that you were saying. I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, we've got several nurses. Y'all you know, just had to use a little thing. And, and I'm sure... That there's a lot of stuff that as a nurse you can do and you can handle. And your education's prepared you and you've got your little little pen and, and, and the diploma and, and you've done, you know, recurring studies and stuff. You, you've watched the internet and, you know, you can be a doctor on the internet and stuff. So, I mean, I, I realize that. Not a nurse. Because, you know, y'all playing cards. Ooh, no. I'm just playing. I'm playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Because I know that, I, yeah. I know nurses, and y'all gonna beat me later on. I'm just playing, because I, I know what y'all do. But you know, even as a nurse, what I realize is, is as much as you can do with the great gifts that you have been given, I guarantee you, you ain't in control of everything. And there are just some things that are beyond us. I guarantee you, as a mother, when you're praying for your child, there are some things that you can try to do, take care of, but you can't take care of everything. There's some things as a man that you say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick myself up, and I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna do these things, but you can't do everything. Why? Because you ain't in control. Those sandals, those shoes are not yours to fill. They, the, they belong to, to Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can think and fit into the shoes of being Lord and Master and Ruler. Those ain't your shoes. Get out of his sandals. They do not belong to you. You can't even tie his sandals, let alone wear his shoes. So why in the world would you ever think to yourself, I'm in control of my life? You ain't in control of anything. We, we just need... Him. So our next right choice, the, the thing, the step that you and I need to take may just be is that we need to step up out of his sandals. It is cute. It is cute. When Riley or one of them, they all of a sudden, you know what, they get them big boy shoes on, right? So they look at Papa's big old shoes and the size 11s and stuff. And he's got, what size is he wearing? Like a, a two or whatever. And so, you know, he gets them little size twos and them big old feet. And he's scrubbing through the house like a big man and stuff. You know, they got them cowboy boots on. Well, that's exciting to get them little bitty shoes and the, the little bitty feet and them big old, big old honking shoes. That's cute for a little kid. It ain't cute when you and I try to do it. It ain't cute when you and I try to get in those shoes and say, God, I'm the one who, who's control. I'm the one who's ruling and leading. I'm shuffling my feet and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Most of our stuff that we regret in our past is because we try to step into his shoes. God, you ain't telling me. God, you may have said that in your word, but I ain't going to listen to that one. God, I, 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 don't, I don't, you know, that, that's not, the, that's not the, the choice I want to make. It may be what you want me to make, but I ain't doing that one. What? There have been more divorce papers signed because stepping in the wrong shoes. There have been more families whose kids just have gone crazy because they're stepping into the wrong shoes. There are folks who made one bad decision and, and you're in the mess that you're in because you didn't make the next right choice. The choice that you made was to step into the shoes that do not belong to you. And here the Lord says, look, you know, we're not even worthy of untying the sandal strap, worthy not even to loose it. What makes us think that 
that we can step into his shoes. Those ain't your shoes to fill. One of the best things that you and I can do is just make the decision, even today, that says, God, I'm going to step out of your shoes. You fill the shoes of being Lord of my life. You fill the shoes of, of being in control. You be the one who, who guides me, leads me, directs me in all these things. And so we step out of, of his, his shoes. You know what it ends up being if you make that next right choice? If you say to yourself, I'm going to make the next right choice, the next step, the decision to get out of his shoes, to give ownership and lordship to the Lord, there is a, a sense of peace that comes over your life when you realize he is filling his shoes and I'm just going to hold on today. When, when you realize, Lord, you're the Lord, you're the master, you're the ruler, and I'm just going to fill the spot that I am, which is by your side or around your neck. I had, I had the privilege this, this week, some, um, I, I know that, uh, I know they had Sylvia was supposed to be watching, you know, little Noah and stuff, and so, uh, you know, she, she's, she's available for hire if anybody needs to, because Daddy tired of paying her stuff, and so, um, you know, but she was, <laughs> just put that little plug in there, uh, but she was babysitting a little bit this week, but one of the cool things about having a, a little kid in the house was little, little kids don't really have boundaries. And so little kids, you know, they don't mind, like, knocking on doors and checking to see where you are. They're running through the house. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And so all of a sudden, though, it is that I would come, and I come to, to the house and sit on my throne, you know, my little recliner. Um, and so I'm there. And then this little dude, instead of, like, sitting on, on, on the couch next to me, he decides, no, I want to, like, sit on your armrest right up by your side. Now, I don't know if he ever does that with y'all, but he showed up with the Hawaiian. He's like, let me get right up next to Uncle Marcus. I'm going to just sit right by his side. Why? Because he figured out the couch was cool. Sylvia was on the other side. That's fine as well. But I'm sitting on the big boy chair right on the recliner, right on the little armrest, right by his side. That's where he felt like he fit. Can I tell you in your life, you know where you fit? It's not in the big boy chair. It's on the, the side next to the big boy chair. It is in you saying, you know what, Lord, you're on your throne. I'm not on it. Lord, you're the one who fills the sandals of being Lord over my life. Those aren't my shoes to fill. And all I do is I sit by the side, I put my arms around your neck, and I hold on for the ride. I just say, Lord, you're, you're the Lord of my life, and I step out of your shoes. Stepping out of the Lord's sandals means that we do one thing. We humble ourselves. Instead of walking in pride, we step out and we step and walk in humility. Instead of walking in according to, to, to my way, we step out and step and do things God's way. Instead of, you know, uh, even this morning, instead of sitting right where I am at this pew, I'm going to step out of the, 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 the pew and I'm going to just come in and just lay it down at the altar of the Lord. I'm going I'm to make the next right choice. See, here's the next thing, though, is that we need to step into his service. If you look at verse 23 and 26 and 29, I'll, 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 I'll speed this up a little bit. We step out of his shoes and we step into his service. One thing that, that he did over and over again is that he pointed people to Jesus. Verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know what John says? It's not about me. It's all about him. And I'm just a servant. It's not about me. It's all about him. And I'm just a servant. I'm going to step out of his sandals. I'm going to step into his service. It's not about me. It's all about him. And I'm going to serve him. It's not about me. It's all about him. I'm just going to serve him. You know, today, if you were to follow John's example, that would be a great example for you to follow. It's not about me, God. It's, I'm not Lord of my life. It's not about me. It's not about what I want, what I think, what I think is best for my life. It's not about me, but it's all about you. It's not about lifting you up, and I'm going to point people to Jesus. Every time John saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He pointed them straight to Jesus. If some of you were to do that today, your reason for existing, God could have taken you and you could have been to heaven already. God could have taken you and you could have died a long time ago. God could have taken you and he could have saved you from all those dumb things that you did as a, a high schooler on that motorcycle or when you were driving fast before you realized you got to pay for gas. I mean, all those things that you used to do, God rescued you and saved you from those things. But why? It is so that you might point people to Jesus. Yeah. Every mistake, every hardship, everything that you've ever done in your life, all that is created and designed so that you could then point people to Jesus. People who are hurting, people who are in need, you point people to Jesus. And so step out of his sandals, step into his service, but it all begins by this, by, by stepping out of your pew. If church to you is 
just this pew, and it's just these songs, and it's just testimonies, and it's just the Hawaiian who is up there preaching. If that is all church is to you, then you are missing out really on what God has created the church to be. Church is not meant to be in here. It is meant to be out there. It's meant to be together as a body, as a community, but it starts by you getting out of your pew. For some of you today, you need to take, you know, baby steps of just saying, Lord, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to do whatever it says. John 1.19 says, this is the testimony of John. So what is your testimony? 3,922 steps. That, that's how many steps it takes in order to get up to the stairway to heaven. They, they're called the haiku stairs. Doesn't that sound Hawaiian? Yeah, that sounds real, real Hawaiian. So, so it's illegal to go up those stairs, that, that stairway to heaven. Can I tell you, to get to Jesus, it is not illegal. It's impossible to do it on your own. You can't ever take enough steps to get to Jesus, one by one by one, because you'll never be good enough, you'll never have your stuff ready enough, you'll never be right enough. All those next right choices that you make, next right steps that you make, those will never be enough. And so when you couldn't get to him, he came down to you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. Heaven to earth is impossible for us to get from earth to heaven, but heaven to earth was, was really, for God, one small step for God to get down to earth. But when he came down to earth, it was one giant leap for mankind. You see, he stepped out of heaven to come for us so that we could behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But when he came down to take away the sins of the world, that one step that he took now means that we can leap into the very arms of Jesus and be with him for eternity in heaven. One small step for God was one huge leap for mankind. But how do you get to the Lord? You see, many people, when they've tried to get up that mountain, when they're trying to get up that mountain to, to get those 3,922 steps, Many people have died along the way because they could not make the journey to get up to the mountain. Well, for you to get up to heaven, to get to that mountain of the Lord, Jesus was willing to die. And he took the death on the cross so that he would come down and bring heaven to earth so that when we die, we might be able to bring earth there, there to heaven. And friends, I want you to know today that the reason why the Lord came was so that you could make a next right step. You see, I, I want to encourage you today to, to really step out. Now, I don't know what's all going on in your life, in your relationships, or, or with your sanity level, or with all the stuff that you've got going on, but you know what? The Lord still desires to use your life. I, I believe it's absolutely correct uh, when, when it was said earlier that Brother Donnie, the Lord must have saved you for a reason. There's more that he wants to do with your life. The very fact that you're breathing air today is the same testimony of your life as well. That the Lord says, there's more that I want to do with your life. There's more that God could do, not only to, to raise someone pretty much from the dead, but that he could raise even the most dead and lifeless things in your life. He could raise those things from the dead as well. But it all begins with one small step, with one right choice. And today, for some of you, your next right choice is to step out. Step out of your pew, step out of your comfort zone, and just say, I'm going to step out of all of these things that are holding me back in my relationship with the Lord, and I'm going to step in to being where God wants me to be, and I'm going to step into his service. The scariest thing today could be, for many of you, is this. It is to come and walk to the front and take the preacher by the hand, because somebody out there may think, you know what? They must not have all their life together if they got to talk to the preacher. <laughs> you know what? They... they, they for them to have to come to the altar and stuff, boy, boy they, they really must be some kind of horrible sinner if they got to come, come to the altar. Uh, you know what, if I, if I were to just like raise my hands in, in a moment as, as Brother Wayne leads us, boy, there's something really got to be wrong with that person to, to be emotional during a time like this. That may be your opportunity to just step out. Because you stepped there and sat there long enough to where life has never changed. But in order for you to get closer to the Lord, maybe that one step, one step out of your pew, one step asking someone if they could just move a little bit so that you can come down, maybe take a knee at this altar, maybe take the preacher by the hand, and say, I need you to be praying for me. There's stuff that, that I need to get to, and I can't do it all at one time. But you know what happens? You take one 
next right step. And you add that to another next right step. Before you know it, you'll be up on top of that mountain. But it happens one step at a time. Would you bow your heads? Friends, thank you for joining us today at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We hope you'll be able to join us this coming Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or 6 o'clock in the evening time, Wednesdays at 6 o'clock for our prayer service, and we also have youth and children's activities as well. We look forward to seeing you. Hope to meet you in person here in Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We hope to see you soon.